A bowl of Manx political broth on perspective this week with a bit of everything thrown in. What looked like a fairly bland tin world order paper delivered several lively debates, a few mini rebellions, and a ministerial olive branch being snapped in pieces and thrown back in the minister's faces. Joni Farragher was giving the Department of Infrastructure quite a kicking in Tinwald. I asked her what her particular gripe with the department was. I mean, I guess they were sort of threefold, really. First of all, I felt that their approach to the red, amber, green risk rating um, was a different approach taken by other departments, let's say. Um, I felt that there wasn't, there was maybe a, a, a lack of alignment there with how people perceived it. There was only one that was in amber and the rest of them were all in green. Uh, the one that I particularly picked out there was energy security, which um, I feel that we haven't got that. We, we, you know, the need, the pressing need for homegrown and sustainable energy is more and more prevalent every day um, and that's the, the agreement for offshore wind has been ongoing for some years and we're just no closer to it so I didn't feel that like that warranted a green rating and, and I really called on the department to be maybe a little bit more honest about its um, risk ratings there. Um, secondly I was talking about uh, social housing and the need for social housing and the lack, uh, the lack of that in the in the plan and I felt that Really, uh, with with that being such a huge issue on the doorsteps and with the fact that we all know that housing is pressing on the island, uh, I thought that the, the absence of that in the plan was um, was quite remarkable, really. Um, and, and, and finally, I think... Um, I was I was pressing the department to put more outcomes and time scales in there. So um, again, to go back to the energy security one, for example, which I would have personally said was a very urgent need right now. Um, what what is the what is the intended outcome of their negotiations with the agreement for lease for the wind wind farm? Uh, what are the time scales that they're putting on those negotiations? Um, and and you know when can we actually look to, to having a solution there? So, uh, so I suppose they were the three things that I was pulling up up from them. And it is fair to say that um, government works slowly. Uh, you know, there's an inevitability about the the, the, the sort of slow processes of uh, ensuring that everyone has had their say and everyone's consulted and no one feels left out and um, all of that. Um, but I mean, you mentioned um, wind farms. I mean, we've been talking about that in Tinwald for at least 15 years now. Yeah, it is so frustrating. It really is so frustrating, Phil. Um, I mean, we are literally surrounded by um, sustainable energy. We have the highest um, sunshine levels in Andreas across the British Isles. We um, are surrounded by sea. We have uh, regular windy days. You know, we really could have been leading on this. And now, not only are we not leading, but we are actively behind on this. Uh, the need couldn't really be, be more powerful, not just in terms of the climate science but obviously also in terms of uh, global markets on this issue and we look at other forms of energy and when we look at what other people are doing and what attracts people to um, countries and jurisdictions if we if we got on top of this issue we would attract younger people and it really it's it's what they would call a no-brainer yet we don't seem to be getting any closer to it yeah so why do you think the department felt that it was uh, it, making sufficient progress to, to, to put a green bar alongside practically everything it, that it, it, it was you know, that it had as targets within its plan. Well, the fact of the matter is, I didn't get a response to that actually yesterday, Phil. I uh, I did ask, you know, what what is the department's approach to the to what we call the RAG rating, the red red amber green risk rating, um, and how come it, it appears to be that the department feel that if they are aware of an issue, that mitigates the risk completely, um, and that's not how other people approach the RAG rating system. Um, I, you'd have to ask the minister why they feel like they've got a green on all of those, because I could not tell you. I did, and I don't think I got a straight answer, it's fair to say. <laughs> that was Joni Farragher, and we'll hear more from Joni in relation to social housing later. But I'm joined now by Jason Moorehouse. Minister Allinson, who's bringing a private min- member's bill, and um, it's, it's difficult to actually get the clarity in terms of the private members bill who's actually ultimately responsible for all the checks and balances because the private member who brings it is ultimately the driving force but in a situation where you've got a minister who is doing that and you've got the consultation going through the cabinet office how do you actually untangle the two 
you know, if there's an issue with that consultation and she's still being delivered by the cabinet office, then surely there should be some overriding check to ensure that things are as they should be. And I've tried that route. And again, next Tuesday, I'll be bringing the same question to Dr. Allison to actually ask him the specific questions linked to the specific consultation. It's quite an interesting twist, really, that he's in Comin, he's doing something outside Comin, and it's such a key issue for the whole island that to get the d- division is quite hard, really. And, and, and the vast majority of the, of the Manx public don't really mm. understand, or indeed need to understand, that there is a distinction between government and parliament, you know, in, yeah. in, or Tinwald, uh, for, for, um, you know, the uh, House of Keys, Tinwald, and Legislative mm. Council is and should be, and and in all mature democracies around the world, uh, Parliament is independent of government. Mm. It's a bit different in the Isle of Man in as much as almost everybody, you, you, you are one uh, of the, uh, I think, two exceptions that, that members, although there's quite a few LegCo members now that are uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but certainly you and the Speaker in the Keys yeah. are, are, are not directly mm. engaged with government. Um, but everybody else is. So yeah. it's quite hard, I think, to, to understand those separations. Um, but actually, you, what you've said to me, I, I, I hadn't fully appreciated. A private member's bill um, have been consulted. Uh, the Cabinet Office shouldn't really have any involvement in that if it's a private member's bill, surely. That, that's it, but it's been fed through the Cabinet Office in terms of getting to the people. So when the people are filling this up, they're assuming it's just a standard government consultation and there's no real clarity on the um site to say that this is something quite different and yeah it's quite an interesting one because in terms of the checks and balances they don't seem to be as clear as they would be if it Mm. was a government consultation because of course the cabinet office runs the consultation hub Mm. so presumably the, the the bill is going through the government's consultation hub. Yeah. So I can, I can kind of now understand a bit better what uh, what the mm. purpose of the question is, and it, yeah. it does seem strange to me. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, a pretty serious question as to whether um, private members' bills should be available through the government's consultation hub. They, mm. they probably should be a separate system for private members' bills uh, operated by the Clark of Tinwald's office. Yeah, well, that's what I would have thought, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, no doubt we'll find out more mm. uh, when uh, uh, Minister Allenson um, dis- discusses his private members' bill with you on uh, on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, loads of other uh, items. I mean, you had loads of other questions. Were there any, any other particular questions that you, you or, or the answers to which that you wish to highlight? Or? Um, one of the concerns was looking at the the government reserves and the way in which the investment managers have been assessed and chosen at the moment. And there's been complete silence since last March. And I'm aware of um, local businesses who've actually gone into the consultation process and they're just kind of confused by the radio silence. It was interesting in terms of the answer that there has been radio silence, nothing has gone on. And yeah, it's just an ongoing process. Because it's a big deal, isn't it? I mean, Huge. the reserves uh, um, amount to was it one point six billion, or mm, is it maybe yeah. more than that now? Um, and you know, if if you get it right uh, in terms of investing those reserves, you could make millions of pounds for the Isle of Man. If you yeah. get it wrong, you could lose millions. That's it. And it's one thing actually. Asked a lot of questions about this time last year because there were questions in terms of the process, in terms of we were actually going from a existing clear system in terms of something that had been replicated annually since the start of the century to something quite radically different and I was trying to find out why we're actually going down a new road and I was repeatedly getting answer from the Treasury Minister, sorry we can't actually talk about this because it's part of a procurement process and so I went that one extra step up and I asked the Attorney General and that was probably one of my most frustrating days in Timor because I asked the question but then I wasn't allowed to ask a supplementary question. So I can actually come back to get the clarification in terms of the strategy has changed, but why has there been no public explanation of that? Mm-hmm. And sure the Treasury Minister can actually give a reason why 
local providers who've been dealing with this for many, many years suddenly can't actually participate in a, a bidding process because they haven't got the expertise. Why has this change happened and what will the benefits be? And it felt to be yeah, a really, really difficult point because I'd been repeatedly asking questions to the Treasury Minister trying to move things forward. I thought, next step up. And the President, yeah, moved me on rather quickly. <laughs> well, I imagine from what you're saying, you, you, you haven't had the answers you're looking for. So we may mm -hmm. see future questions on future order papers. And yeah. Another one that you asked was in relation to... Uh, uh, well, oh no, it was in relation to the government accounts. Um, when, when are the government accounts going to be published? And uh, it started off with a very bold end of January, and then it was aiming for the end of January. Mm. And then uh, I think by the time we got to a third uh, supplementary, hopefully we're aiming for the end of January. And yeah. actually this, this matters because there's a budget coming up in, in February. And uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Watterson, uh, pointed out that the light blue book, which used to have mm. loads of extra detail in about government accounts, uh, is no longer being published. And mm. the Treasury Minister said that's because it's not audited. So... Um, uh, because they're unaudited, we're, we're not going to provide that information, mm. even though that actually was a... It's, it's the equivalent of, uh, I suppose, business accounts where you know, the actual operational stuff was in mm. that you could better understand, you know, the published accounts, which is the bit that you are going to yeah. possibly get, aiming for the end of January, uh, January hopefully. Um, the audited accounts will be out, um, but they don't give you anywhere near the detail that the, the, the unaudited light blue book... Uh, had, had given for to members for, for many uh, decades. That, that's it. It just seems that the press has been held up by some very technical issues that are raising more questions in terms of they're looking at the value of various assets on the island. And in terms of those assets, they're actually valuing these assets for the first time in some cases to actually enable us to look at potentially more borrowing. It's, you know, is there another reason for this and it, it does look rather serious that we we're not going to potentially have the accounts many days before the budget and it was my last supplementary question in terms of will we actually get this before the budget and previously we've had that reassurance they will be there on the, at the end of january they will be there in time and we finished the questioning session it was kind of basically possibly we will have them but there was mm. no guarantee and and well, even if you did, you know, I think uh, you know, members might might think, or the listeners might think, well, mm -hmm. you've got a couple of weeks then to to pour through the government accounts and make the comparison with the the budget, mm -hmm. um, and and that's all fine. But actually, you, you've got other things to do. You yeah. you don't have just one particular item, one particular issue to to address. I mean, there's nothing more important, I would suggest. Um, in February than making sure the budget is right uh, mm. but still you have constituents ringing up on a, on a regular mm. basis many of the most of the Timble members have uh, departmental responsibilities as well that they have to undertake so and of course you have parliamentary duties on yeah. committees so uh, yeah it, it's not giving you a lot of time. We have some time but yeah as you say all the other mm. commitments all the other things it's yeah going to be challenging with it only coming one year and being so important for setting the direction, it, it needs to be looked at carefully and thought about. And also, even though we can't talk to people about the budget, we can do that research in terms of what this change will meet up, mean on these other areas. So, yeah, we do need time because that's quite an important thing that we're given the documentation before the budget. We're expected to do the research, but we can't actively discuss anything within it. So it's all down to us. And fortunately, I have a background in that area. So... I have some knowledge of how to go about it, but some of the members are coming at it completely new. So, yeah, interesting times. One thing that, I mean, I, maybe I'm, I'm just out of politics for far too long and I don't understand how it works anymore, ah. but it seemed really strange to me that you, as so Southern members, you win a concession in relation to the, uh, the pools debate, mm. uh, which was a... Um, a government supported amendment mm. uh, which g gave an awful lot more reassurance to the likes of the southern yeah, pool and expanded is. to mention the, mm. the the regional sports hubs that were, mm. were being mentioned which is you know it's effectively stuff that government um, was prepared to do government might well see this as they were magnanimous 
but the Southern members, it's fair to say, didn't hold back, did they? No, I think that's quite an important point, and it's something we've raised before in terms of this discussion, that it's the first time that really, in the South of the Island, we haven't had a minister who's been constrained by those ministerial duties, and, you know, it's given us a lot of freedom, you know. We've also got... Um, to MLC members who give us that extra support as well. So we are a sizable grouping within Tim Walden. You know, we can use that for the benefit of the local people, as we did on Wednesday. But, uh, I mean, looking at it from, from my sort of uh, political uh, outlook, um, if, you, if you go and poke someone in the eyes who's just been magnanimous and, and given you something, um, are they likely to be as supportive again in the future? Well, that's the problem with working with adults. And, yeah. <laughs> when I used to work with children, they were much more well, forgiving. Well, unfortunately, yeah, most, you know. most people engaged with politics have enormous egos, don't they? I mean, it's, it goes with the territory. Mm. You wouldn't be able to be a politician if you didn't have some sort of an ego. Um, and uh, uh, you, damaging egos uh, when it's necessary is, is, is all well and good, but damaging egos when, when perhaps... Um, the, 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 you know, the ministers in, involved directly in this have, have, have conceded a particular point mm. uh, just felt felt a little bit dangerous to me but I mean I, mean, I enjoyed the debate and, yeah, and the contribution it possibly is dangerous but it's a benefit of Manx politics because there are so few of us we hopefully all play a valuable part and so whereas in Westminster you can actually lose 10-15 members and you can remove the whip etc in the Isle of Man if you fall out with me today then hopefully tomorrow you'll say oh we need more house on the side to get this through. So, yeah, it's, it's that continually regrouping and rethinking and working together constantly. So hopefully we can push the boundaries and gain and, you know, other times we'll perhaps be more generous with our giving than, yeah, we might have been. So, yeah, it's all a matter of keeping things in balance and getting the best outcomes. Michelle Haywood was a former member of the Southern Swimming Pool Board and obviously a member for the South. Uh, so what did she think of all this? No, I think it's a report that really reflects that you know, if you employ a UK-based consultancy, however experienced they are with pools and local authorities in the UK, they don't get the Isle of Man context and they didn't understand the Isle of Man context and the history. And, and your particular concerns, I mean, obviously as a former pool board member, pool board members of the South were criticised, um, but perhaps uh, criticised in a sort of veiled way. Um, it was, was that the bit that... that that particularly uh, uh, upset you uh, with regards to the report? Um, I think it was. I think uh, I served with some of those members. I know how hard they work. And they're, they're volunteers. You get elected into your local board and then somebody says, oh, well, you know, who wants to take over being a representative on various different things, like sheltered housing boards, amenity sites, pool boards, all in there. Um, and so you're doing it as a volunteer. And it is not that the problems in the Southern Pool weren't brought to the department's attention. And I appreciate that the minister is relatively new, but the officers in the department have known about the issues down there for a while, and they've known that they were issues around HR, around employment law. There are, you, know, you have to contract in somebody to manage those things for you when you're a very small board like that, because even if you had those professional skills, it wouldn't be right to bring them in and, and necessarily be advising the board on matters that could expose them to legal action. So... All of those sort of like background levels of central services and support just haven't been forthcoming from the department or, or the DOI, to be fair, either. So both of them are kind of complicit in creating an environment where this was always going to happen. And having taken the decision to gradually withdraw funding effectively by freezing the subvention and then to not pay out for the maintenance that was needed in the southern pool they've almost driven the pool to being in the position it's in and i'm really upset for the previous board members who've worked so hard to keep it going when all the time the department was busy deciding that they were going to underfund it it is fair to say though that uh, the current uh, southern pool board seems to be getting quite a bit of support now from the department of education what do you think has uh, has, has has changed I know when we were first elected, actually, the Southern members lobbied very, very hard for the department to get involved and provide support. Um, and that was within a couple of weeks of the election happening that we'd sat down. Uh, I think it was almost as soon as the minister was appointed, we, we were there, you know, sort of uh, going through the issues. So I'm glad the department listened to us at the time and have provided continuing support. Um, the problems at the Southern Pool are not new and they're not 
it's it's not that this board has, has identified them as such. I think you know, it's unfortunate that they um, didn't have very much of a handover from previous boards, uh, where you know, sort of more experienced members would have told, explained some of these things, and then perhaps it's a shock when you find them out for new for yourself. Um, but equally, the administration and, and and the the staff down at the pool have been involved in those discussions with the previous boards as well. So th- there should have been some more continuity there in terms of of management. But I think. That's one of the inherent problems is that you've got this ever changing, you know, every five years you throw the board out and you, you, you get a new board in and you don't know who you're going to get. So I think that's that's part of the issue about how do we manage these very valuable facilities. It, it, it doesn't work in the way we're doing it now. It is fair to say that um, the, uh, the, uh, all the, the relevant legislation concerning the establishment of the, the regional pools um, remains quite silent as to how the relationship is supposed to work between government and uh, local government. Um, do, do you think that? Well, do you hope perhaps that this that this is an opportunity for that relationship to be uh, more clearly defined, so that uh, in the future there isn't the the level of uncertainty that appears to be there as to who's responsible for what. Yeah, and I, the report mentions that you know there's a large subvention handed over, and there's no service level agreement, there's no KPIs, there's nothing to monitor that, and and that's absolutely, you know, just not acceptable anymore. Uh, probably wasn't acceptable back then either, but I think this actually speaks to the heart more of how do we manage all of those uh, local authority boards that are separate from the local authorities. I know when I was chair in Port Mary, I started insisting that we had reports back in from from those members that we sent to these boards and and up till then there'd been a resistance and so I said well the the board's business is private it's like but you're there as a representative of this board and so even that level of clarity and that level of oversight is is not there so I actually I think it's a sort of a a a wider problem than just the swimming pool boards but obviously this is where it's it's become obvious now. As a southern member um, I, I suppose two two obvious questions have the southern members actually discussed the findings of the report with the southern swimming pool board and also what would you recommend to the local authorities in the south who have the option of paying up to 6p as a rate um, do do they do they do the the uh, the generous thing and and offer the full 6p do they pay uh, two and a half p, which they've been paying in the past. Uh, w- uh, h- how would how would you approach this? Um, yes, I've had contact with some of the the current and former board members uh, to discuss the report. Um, I think when and I was part of the pool board that suggested the rates needed to change, and it's taken a long time to get that through. But at the time, the department was saying no, there's no more subvention, and so what you're doing then is you're looking for every possible income stream that can support the increased costs that pools are experiencing and so changing the rate was one of them I know that most of the local authorities had budgeted for that a couple of years ago they'd included the higher rate in there but we know that that's about 10% overall of the money that the pool needs so even if the local authorities doubled what they paid you know, for Port St Mary it would go up from just over £3,000 to just under £7,000 it's actually a drop in the ocean drop in the pool that's a really bad pun isn't it it's it's a it's a small contribution to what's needed overall and costs have risen so massively for our pools that it's not going to make very much difference changing the rates and the money has to come from central government and the subvention has to change i was have to say i was very disappointed with the debate in as much as there weren't any obvious pool puns said you know jumping in at the deep end or or wading in or, or any of this uh, however, um, in, in terms of the long-term f- future then, uh, obviously there's a report coming back in uh, October, which is not just going to look at pools, but it's going to look at uh, the uh, regional sports hubs. Uh, it's going to look at how the uh, go- local government and central government can engage with this process and uh, all of that. What would you hope that uh, that the report will ultimately uh, conclude and uh, that we will start seeing in the regions of the island? Um, I hope that there is a continuing role for local authority members because I think that's a really important link. But what I hope is that there's more centrally provided resources in terms of finance, HR and support around those matters. Um, 
which is not difficult for central government to organise representatives to go into to support boards with that. Um, and then if there's this wider brand offering about sports facilities, I hope it builds into something bigger where we're actually recognising the value of those sports facilities, not just for the well-being of our community, but also for the connections between them and, and how, how important sports clubs are for our communities generally. Should the eastern authorities be paying something towards uh, sports and pool facilities? You know, before before this report came out, I, that was my biggest gripe was that actually there wasn't anything paid by rates, and it is really unfair that you know the northern uh, pool is built on land donated by Ramsey, and Ramsey never got let off their paying their pool rates ever. Um, but for the eastern uh, you know uh, constituents, they don't pay anything towards the pool that's that's on their thing. I I think it's um it's like an unfortunate quirk, isn't it, that actually people don't use the pool that's necessarily local to them. I know people that are going up to Ramsey because that's where the kayaking club has moved to because the Southern Pool is shut on a Sunday afternoon and, and things. So people will move around the island and it's it's wrong for us to think that actually your pools just serve your local community. And so if it's wrong to assume that they're serving local community, it's also wrong to assume it should be locally funded for the pool. It needs to be nationally funded and it needs to be shared out evenly. And then I suppose the obvious question is if it's nationally funded, why does the local authorities, why do local authorities need to, to engage in this uh, at all? I think local representation is always useful because you have a finger on the pulse for what's going on within your community. You can support new groups coming through that perhaps want to use the pool and, and you, you have a connection with them. Um, and I think that's, that's good. I don't think I'd like to see it just hived off into a little office somewhere in St John's where somebody who never actually sets foot in a building is sat there making decisions about it. I don't think that's right at all. It felt in the debate as though bridge, bridges were being burnt between the Southern members and, and the department. Uh, do you think um, peace offerings will now start to uh, appear and uh, you know, endeavours to actually work more collaboratively with the department? No, a peace offering in terms of uh, starting to fund the Castle Russian High School development, I think, would be very welcome from, from all of us. Um, I believe there might be something coming forward in the budget, but if it's just another set of plans, I think we're going to be pretty disappointed with that. We've seen plans <laughs> over years and years and years. And as, as Mrs Masker pointed out today, you know, the, originally the plans did include a pool, and in fact it was just the Northern Pool plan you know, they found space for it on the Castle Russian High School site and said, well, we'll build one of those. It's a great idea. We've already got the plans for that. Presumably we don't have to pay another set of architects fees. So, you know, there were bits like that that suddenly seemed to vanish off the agenda four or five years ago. And it actually took FOI requests from the Southern Pool to get the information out of Treasury and DESC to establish that that pool had been there on the plans and then had vanished. You know, the, the level of communication between the Department of Education and the pool boards has just been shocking. So I'm hoping that actually this is turning a corner now and that the department will start to, to communicate a little better with all of us. No compromises there from Michelle Haywood. Any sign of peace breaking out from Minister Edge, the Education Minister? We've got to move forward from this, Phil. There's no point sitting um going backwards. Um, I think the motion and um, what we've achieved today is the right way for the island. We're going to look at the facilities for everybody in all of our communities and that's the right approach for the island. Um, we shouldn't be focusing just on the south or, or the north. or thing. And obviously the Southern Pool is the oldest one and um, we're all aware of that as the Southern members should be. Um, you know, some of the comments today... Um, you know, I'm not sure um, they have met with the previous boards or with the current boards, to be, to be fair. I'd, I'd hope they have um, uh, when they've read the reports. But the um, key thing is great unanimous decision to give this the opportunity for the department to go away and work with the Department of Infrastructure, do all the maintenance on, on our buildings anyway, and um, come forward with factual information to Tim Wall to decide the right way forward for regional sports hubs, swimming pools, community pools and facilities around the island. I mean, it's great sort of uh, knockabout politics. Uh, you know, people listening at home love to, to hear uh, a kind of black and white debate without the, the nuance and, the, and the, the complications which inevitably cloud any sort of political uh, judgments. Um, but of course, you know, the, 
the officers concerned who, who were involved in uh, the work that's gone on in terms of the swimming pool, I imagine that they'll be less inclined to, to help uh, now that uh, they, they've had such a, 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 a beating in Tinwald. Well, they're professionals. They're all qualified to do the roles that they're doing, particularly swimming pools. They're very regulated, a lot of health and safety. There's chemicals involved. We've got a highly skilled workforce. And, you know, I want to thank them for the work work that they're doing. Um, you know, our officers come forward with information. They, they do their research and they come forward with the right facts. Um, I don't think it's right for members to not establish the facts but then criticise um, the truth. You know, the right facts should be there and, uh, you know, take criticism, yes. The report's been done independently by Knight, Cavender, Kavanagh and Page and um, it's their report. It's not the Department of Education's report and I think that's key and I think some members have, have muddied, muddled, muddied that and some of the local authorities have. It's not our comments, it's the comments of an independent um professional in this field who's done a lot of work um, for, for many local authorities, sports associations and trusts and uh, they were the right people to do it and imagine Phil if I'd have brought forward the recommendations or a report myself it would have been a totally different situation, you can't win we've done it independently, it's the right way and we've got the outcome and now we're going to do this piece of work which is really important for the island Regional sports hubs uh, that, that's quite an, a, an exciting prospect it is, um, and obviously the Manx Sport and Recreation already operate around the island. They do the um, AstroTurf and they do the bookings for all the AstroTurfs. Obviously the department's responsible for the schools and schools are currently responsible for doing their lettings. Um, I think a joined-up approach, a new offer, a new branding, sports on the Isle of Man and you can access all of this. People move to the island if there's facilities like that. We've got amazing facilities. Let's join it up. Let's make it effective, efficient for everybody on the island. Jason Mohouse, there's, there's clearly a, a tension between the department and the Southern members. Uh, is it time that uh, you, you all actually got together and, and tried to work collaboratively? I'm not sure. I think it's possibly going back to the nature of politics that we're all backbenchers and none of us are in education. So when it comes to questioning and ensuring we get the best deal, we've not got the limitations that we might have otherwise. So it perhaps looks like we're kind of acting more forcefully, but possibly because it's all or a large amount of it's public people are picking up picking up on it more as if um, one of us was a minister has been done behind closed doors then the people might not be really thinking this was happening and going on so yeah I think it's perhaps a downside of us being backbenchers that everything is out there and everything's kind of things that people can assess and review and, and presumably you still haven't had the, the call from uh, Chief Minister Cannon to see whether you'd, you'd be willing to join his team? No, no. I don't, I don't, I don't answer my phone very often, though. So. <laughs> well, that might be it then. Uh, yeah, send him a text, uh, Chief well, Minister, uh... if you're listening in. Moving back then to the Department of Infrastructure's plan, obviously the Minister has ambition to have more targets, and so we can expect more reds and ambers next time round. Mm. Um, but things that he that the, the department reckoned they were doing well on and had green bars alongside mm. um, included things like social housing and cleaner uh, e energy um, uh, supplies. Um, there'd be very few people on the island who would think that they're, at the moment anyway, uh, Department of Infrastructure is doing a brilliant job on, on getting new clean energy and um, new um, social housing. That, that's it, isn't it? I think it's the problem with these documents. The documents are now at the stage where they are being produced almost in an automated fashion. It's it's perhaps not giving us the quality and the stand that we should expect. And I think that's one thing that hopefully Minister Thomas left the court thinking that next time it needs to be much more focused. It needs, it needs to have that clarity that people can see and the staging points and the way it can be assessed and all those things weren't really there in detail and it, it was it was a good debate and we were all able to bring something different out. Um, that was from a backbencher's point of view. From the minister's point of view, I think it was a nightmare debate because there were too many moving parts mm. and from his perspective, he would have liked that document to go in, be ticked off and move on and he left thinking, yeah, there are too many unfinished pieces of business here and things that we've 
being over generous on which we won't get through next time if we don't mm-hmm. tighten up on them because I think a lot of people did give them the benefit of the doubt and say you know on this occasion we'll support it but yeah we'll see what happens next time and you, you now have the uh, the label of Jason the Red um, or, or Red Jason perhaps Red Moorhouse uh, in in that you moved a, um, a, a private member's motion uh, for want of a better word to to, uh, to to look at thresholds in relation to social housing yeah. and uh, the Labour Party voted against. I know it was a real surprise because it, it was it was an interesting word in motion because. I linked it back to the living wage in terms of the government uh, shifting things in that direction. But really the core underlying issue was the minimum wage. And in 2019, when the things was last updated, thresholds were last updated, if you'd have been a couple with no children, your income on the minimum wage would have been sufficient for you to be considered for social housing. And you could actually earn another £2,500 extra. If you want to apply for social housing today as a couple with no children and you're working for the minimum wage full time, then your income is actually £4,000 above. And I've got this nightmare situation where so many people are contacting me and saying, but we're on a low income, minimum income as it stands, and we can't qualify, we can't even get on the waiting list. And it's just so frustrating because with the way the system works, if it's £33,000, the maximum threshold, and you earn 33000 and a pound, or even a penny, then you're above the threshold, and you can't be considered. And that's such getting on the waiting list and reduce the possibility that, you, well, it removes the possibility that you can get a, a public sector house, which a lot of these people want. I know it doesn't guarantee, but it gives you that option. And at the moment, those people are just being forced to pay the high rents in the private sector, and some of them are just saying, we can't afford to live here which is quite ironic at the time when we're saying to other people, come and live here. And as I said in my closing remarks, it's it's quite reminiscent of the late 80s, early 90s in terms of we've got these high-paid, fun-loving individuals coming to the island and they, they're they choosing to locate here, whereas the people who've been here all their lives or for a long time are suddenly kind of realising that they aren't getting the things they require in terms of things like housing, um, support for their children, and all those basic things that should be ticked off and should be being dealt with. And I think it was quite, yeah, it was an interesting debate, to say the least. Certainly was. And, and uh, we can actually hear now from uh, Joni Farragher, mm. uh, leader of the Manx Labour Party, to see uh, why she felt that it was a waste of time uh, supporting your motion. In relation then to social housing, we all heard back uh, at election time 2022 um, that uh, the, there was a general view from practically everybody who stood for the election uh, that we have, have a housing crisis. Uh, we're now, what are we, 15 months, 16 months um, into this um, government's uh, term um, and lots of, lots of warm words. Absolutely, and, and and no act, active solutions, and that's that's where we are at at the moment. And we've just uh, had a debate about uh, lifting income thresholds for social housing, which um, I've I've voted against, and I've given my reasons that we need to first of all see a, a targeted and costed plan to build more social and sheltered housing, and that is absolutely fundamental. We know that local authorities across the island are reporting that their housing lists are under strain, especially in my constituency in Douglas. Um, they are having to make very tough priority decisions regularly um, for who will receive um, a unit that's come up and and if we if we then put an influx of further applicants onto already strained housing lists what actual impact will that have it won't house more people it won't give more people ha- housing so as I, I've just said in, in Tim World now I feel that it, we're wasting time talking about income threshold when what we need to be focusing on is a, is a costed plan to be approved by Tim World to build more housing. Is the is part of the problem that housing falls within various um, areas of responsibility? So uh, we have a housing board. We've got the Department of Infrastructure responsible for part of uh, the um, public sector housing. We have various uh, local authorities who are housing authorities responsible for certain bits of housing. Uh, do you think that this is part of the problem? There's just too many, uh, too many uh, chiefs and, and, and not enough Indians. 
I don't know about too many chiefs and not enough Indians. I think they've tried to look at the problem by establishing the Housing Communities Board. Um, but yesterday, again, in, in, in Timwald, um, Mr. Minister Thomas um, stood up as DOI minister and responded to my queries around social housing by saying that that would be the remit of the chair of the Housing Communities Board, which actually is himself. So that that's, you know, that's kind of, I suppose, we, we I think... Everybody needs to take a little bit more responsibility here and, and own this issue. Actually, the DOI could expand the portfolio of local authority housing. That is social and sheltered housing. That is in their remit. So what I was calling for was the, was an expansion of the portfolio uh, before we even look at messing around with thresholds. And don't get me wrong, I'm fully on board with the principle of aligning um, income thresholds for access to social housing proportionally with the living wage. That principle is absolutely sound and one I fully support. I just can't support us putting more people onto the housing lists who would then be in limbo um, and, and wouldn't, would not would add years onto the waiting list for people in, in more need as well. I just, I, ca I can't support that without a fully costed plan to build more, more social and sheltered housing. And I just feel like that is the key to this issue that we need to really unlock. Johnny Farragher there demonstrating that one person's political priority is another political waste of time. So then, in terms of uh, the our island plan mm. debate, uh, I think you were you were a bit uh, naughty on that one too, weren't you? I, I was I was actually really pleased at the final result because last time we had the vote in November, there was only me and Mr. Speaker who voted against it, but this time we actually had um, five of us who voted against the adaption to the our island plan, and it was quite an interesting point because when. I voted against it in November. I actually went in with the idea of outlining my concerns and then voting with it because there is a need to have a plan for the island in terms of the economy and moving forward and things. But I do feel that time to actually vote for it was going to remove the significance of my comments. Whereas this time I went in with the clear decision to actually raise my concerns, but also to say, no, we can't actually go forward with this until these concerns are actually looked at because they are real concerns are affecting real local people today. So, yeah, I had much more clarity this time. And I, I feel more people were seeing that, yeah, the economic strategy is good and has got benefits, but what about something to actually bridge where we are now to where we want to be in five, ten years' time? The, the the one significant criticism I suppose I would have of the uh, of our island plan is is the objectives are all to be delivered after the next election, mm. which makes it hard for for the public come election time mm. to be able to pass judgment on how successful or otherwise the council of ministers have been in relation specifically to to our island plan. But um, there's loads of good things in it, aren't there? Oh yeah, there are good things in it. But again, it's back to your point in terms of. We've actually got a plan for a significant time period that one of the key components is increasing the island's population wasn't really discussed by anyone in the last election. And we're going to go forward to the next election and we're going to have done all this work, we're going to have paid out all this money, we're going to get all these plans in action. And it's a case of, are you the person who's happy taking this forward? And if the electorate think that's the thing to go for and those are the people to support and send up to um, the House of Keys, all well and good, but if the people decide that that's not the course of action they're really wanting, we're going to have a, a parliament focused on five years of planning that is completely pointless, and, and that was really back to my point in terms of, I've been given five years, I've now got less than four years, and I'm really concerned about getting things done, because when it's, you go to the doorstep, unless you've actually done things and people can see the improvements then they're not going to vote for you. And more simple than that, if we want to keep people here, bring people back and get people to move to the island, we need to get the basics right. You know, if we're hearing about people can't afford housing, we're hearing about people who are having issues with their young people and getting support, then you're going to think, mm, is this the place to come to? If you're going to look at Castle Russians, you hear about the new school, and you're going to think, well, there's going to be a new school 10 years ago. Is that going to come through? And there's so many kind of and answer questions about today, and I think that is really, really important. We need to actually solve today's problems at the same time as planning for what the next parliament will hopefully do. And perhaps, to a certain extent, this is a bit like um, 
uh, freedom to flourish, Alf C- Cannon's version of it, you know, the aspiration is is great, mm. but people's um, understanding of reality and uh, you know expectation of of uh, a very slow pace of change um, is is uh, you know it, it it's it's hard to see how you move from where people are in terms of their thinking to actually inspire them to move as quickly as as, as the plan would uh, would would wish and and you know here we are we're well over 20 percent through the, uh, the 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 term of yeah. of the house of keys uh the term of this uh, government and uh, we've only just managed to get the final seal on on what what the plan is and then of course one of the uh the, the sort of clauses of, of of the actual motion said but this is a working document mm. that we can potentially they could they could have gone home that night and and changed it because it's a a, a living plan yeah and that was kind of one of the most interesting points about the debate that people say well where's this item gone where's this item come from and that moving of the deck chairs does create a level of uncertainty and it adds that confusion in terms of we aren't dealing with today's problems and in terms of the solutions for tomorrow what are they going to be what what are we really focusing on and um it, it really is kind of concerning that you know you've got things like the airport knowledge gateway and that's a small location right in front of the airport it should be solvable and doable really quickly and instead we're kind of talking about something much more grand and much more significant arriving in 10 years time and you you look at these entrepreneurial people coming to the island and setting businesses up and you're seeing local businesses that can't survive and move forward and really showing despair and i'm finding it kind of difficult to actually balance the two extremes of real optimism for the future and real issues for today and yeah and there seems to be me and a small number of people are actually highlighting this issue at the moment you're starting to become a bit of a stone in, in, in the shoe of government at the moment, aren't you? I am, and I'm actually enjoying it because not being caught in a department has advantages because I've been both in health and infrastructure previously. And in infrastructure, I was always told, you know, we can't push it forward because you're not a political member. You've got to go on the list with all the other people. Whereas once I'm outside infrastructure... I can suggest, I can talk to the minister, I can bring motions, I can ask questions about uncomfortable things and I'm able to shift things. So it's actually, I, f- I feel far more productive as a backbencher than when I was a political member, which is an interesting point. And that should be quite a worrying thing for any government minister listening into this programme. I think it is because having seen how a minister is placed in a very confined position... And the day-to-day requirements are so huge and expectations are so significant to actually have a backbench who's got the freedom to move around, to ask uncomfortable questions, to bring key issues to the public agenda at any point is quite concerning, but hopefully good for Manx politics. And I suppose uh, many uh, political members listening to this who are members of departments might well start thinking to themselves, well, what am I, what am I gaining from from departmental membership? I mean, what has always been understood in the past is departmental membership allows you to have a far greater say and control over the development of policy in a particular area than you would as a backbencher, because all you can do is put down declaratory motions, which are either supported or not. Mm. Um, but ultimately, the the main decisions on the policies are going to be made by those people who are sat around the table. It's it's a difficult one, and um, it really goes back to my first meeting I had in infrastructure, and we were discussing something, and um, the CEO said to the minister, "Are you happy with that minister?" And the minister said, um, I- "I'm," and the CEO calmly said, "Well, let Mister Morehouse say his point again," and so I said my point again, and the minister. Said, I get it. And the CEO said, thank you, Minister, let's move on. And I thought, oh, crikey, everything's just being shifted mm. by the invisible hand. And that's the problem being a minister, that the invisible hand is there. And you're not always sure when that invisible hand is directing you and when it's not. And, yeah, I feel to be in a lucky position at the moment. Well, I hope you've enjoyed listening as much as I've enjoyed pulling those little snippets from Timwald together um, in relation to the Timwald we've just had this week. So what do you think? Is Jason Moorehouse right to stay outside of government? Can he be more effective that way? 
Or uh, is he better trying to work collaboratively with the rest of the Tinwald team? Please get in touch with Phil Gorn at manxradio.com and let me know your thoughts and views on the programme. And let me know if you have any ideas for future shows. But for now, I'm Phil Gorn, Garo Mayo, son Thanks for listening.